burn right through this. Syntax, okay? What is syntax? Syntax is word order, or more specifically, rhythm. Rhythm, hard spelling word. How can you remember how to spell it? Because it's R-H-Y, T-H-M spells a rhythm. R-H-Y, T-H-M spells rhythm. Syntax is rhythm. What sort of writers do you suppose have to be very concerned with rhythm? Poets. Poets, obviously poets. And we read Martin Luther King, I hope my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And then there's Winston Churchill in the Battle of Britain. Never before have so few given so much for so many. What do they have in common, Churchill and King? Syntax. Yeah, syntax, speech writers, orators. So poets, speech writers, who else pays attention to rhythm? Song. Songwriters. Songwriters. Lyric. You know that lyrics are the words to a song? You know how much I like ancient Greece? Where does that word come from? That comes from lyre. That was the U-shaped harp that Apollo played, god of poetry. And so that's where the word lyric comes from. All right? Next one, rhetoric. Rhetoric. All right? Uh, somebody want to tell me what rhetoric is? Madeline, what's rhetoric? Language is a type of rhetoric, so it's like language style? Yeah, language style, but the big word to remember with rhetoric is persuasion. 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 All sales is rhetoric. Do you want the card today? All right. Um, all law is rhetoric. She's guilty. He's not guilty. All law is rhetoric. All sales is rhetoric because all rhetoric argues a thesis. And all sales has a thesis, which is buy my merch. All law has a thesis. My client is guilty, or my client is innocent. My client would be guilty, all right? My client would be innocent if I'm defending him. I'm a bad lawyer if my client, I'm arguing that my client's guilty. Uh, so thesis is your position, and your antithesis then is your opposition. My thesis, my rhetoric is, my client is innocent, the prosecutor has the antithesis, your client is guilty, all right? Rhetoric is persuasion, and that's why Thomas Jefferson said the pen is mightier than the sword. Anybody can make you do something with a sword. They didn't persuade you. That takes language, that takes rhetoric. Rhetoric is persuasion. Okay, tone. One of the ways you can persuade somebody is through your tone. Tone is the emotional upshot of style. Tone is the emotional upshot of style. It is an aspect, and many of these terms overlap each other. It is an aspect of form, right? Form covers all these terms. Form is how we use language. Form is a way of talking about style, how something is said. So tone, the emotional upshot of style, is how we say something. As opposed to content, that's not how we say it, but that is what we say. It's not style, but subject. I think this will become clearer with a kind of funny example. To a Yankee like me, dude is still a funny word, all right? So that's our content. Remember in the story of an hour, we got the guy who dropped his phone, who's walking away, and we're calling him, right, dude? So the content is the same in every example I'm going to give here. But look at the number of different ways, tone, that we can say that word. Scared. Your buddy was supposed to come over at 9 p.m. He never showed. Now it's 3 a.m. You hear somebody wiggling your doorknob out front. Dude? Oh, 
Your buddy just told you that he left an Eskimo pie in the glove box of his girlfriend's brand new car. Dude, your buddy just got a full scholarship to the University of Florida. Dude, congratulatory. I'm not doing the next one. Somebody want to do a sexy one? Who's brave? Who's going to do a sexy dude? Come on, I had somebody do it in every other class. Who's going to be great in here? Deliver a nice, sexy dude. Come on, be brave. Be brave. No? No? Um, All right! <laughs> well done. <laughs> He's brave. <laughs> so now you see, my point is, the content, do you see, it's the same word. Do you see the content? And we, we almost always want to say, you say, but meaning, meaning is always in what we say, right? We just proved, no, quite the contrary. Actually, in that example, the meaning was carried in every instance, not by content, but by form, in this case, tone, in the way that we said it. And that's why tone is so important. All right, a uh, quick and important history lesson on the next two. Establishment language and vernacular language, all right? Vernacular language, big important concept here. Vernacular language is the language of the people. I'll put that in quotation marks of the common people, you might say, everyday people. It is informal, it's chatty, colloquial, it includes profanity, it includes all slang, it includes contractions, as opposed to establishment language. This language is of the educated of the ruling class, of the dominant class. It is not informal, it is formal. Now one is not better than another, they're just different. Now what determines which you use? Establishment or vernacular language? What's gonna be the operative factor? You know them both. Setting or use a more English professory term. Audience. 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 If you all had to give a speech next week, wouldn't you like to, me to tell you if it's going to be to a group of Rayford convicts or a group of NASA scientists? Be helpful to know, wouldn't it? <laughs> because your language will be different according to whom you're speaking to. Ah, because if I'm going to ask for a bank loan, I won't. Yo, bro, I need some corn, help me out, right? <laughs> That's probably not the language I'm going to use with that. How do you do, sir? I'm here about a loan. All right. Same content, just different language. Now, what's the history of this? Quick history lesson, and I think you'll find this very enlightening. Um, in Europe, in 1500, anybody know what the penalty for translating the Bible into English was? Excommunication. Oh, there's more than that, yeah. Yes. I've been to the Tower of London where they put you to death for translating the Bible into English, and it was not an easy death. What they did was they tied you to a post about five feet off the ground, and then they put branches all the way around the post, and they lit it. And uh, you didn't burn to death. What happened was, uh, what well, you burn and your skin peeled off and you bled to death. Uh, slow and nasty way to go. And you go, that was for translation? Uh, yeah, that was for translation. Why, why was that? Well, what was the establishment language in Europe in 1500? Anybody know? Latin. 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 So the way it worked was, let's imagine you're the king of England, I'm the king of France, she is a uh, queen of uh, Germany, all right? The rest of you are subjects, all right? You all speak 
the vernacular languages. What? English, French, and German. Those are all vernacular language of the people languages. But when we royals get together, what do we speak to each other? Latin. Latin, which none of you can understand. Do you see how much power that gives us? And not only that, how are you going to read the Bible? How are you going to get to heaven? Can you read the Bible yourselves? No. We read the Bible for you. We hold the keys to heaven. You want to get to heaven? You've got to get past us. There's only one other class of people that reads Latin, that can read the Bible, can let you into heaven besides us. Who's that? The clergy. The clergy. Priests. All right? So along comes Martin Luther, not King, the original German one. He says, I'm going to translate the Bible into German, into the vernacular, and there is the root word, protest. They're both Christians. The Protestants say, I don't need a priest to talk to God. I can read it in the vernacular. I can read the Bible in English. I can read it in German. I can read it in French. I'll talk to God myself. I don't need a king. I don't need a priest. What? You think you're doing an end run around me? I'm going to burn you for that. It was serious business. This was the power of language, of vernacular, and it caused, this was called the Great Schism in Christianity, all right? Now, you say, okay, that's some interesting history, but it's sure not like that today. Oh, really? Why do you think a legal contract is not written in language that anybody can understand? Why is a legal contract not written in vernacular language? Who wouldn't you need? A lawyer. Exactly. Exactly. So now that's the modern priest. You need to go get a lawyer if you get in legal trouble, all right? So all professions still have establishment languages. Part of the reason you guys are in college is to become literate with establishment language because it's a gate. It's a gate that keeps people out. If you can't speak it, it'll block you. Texture. The arrangement of small elements, right? The story of an hour. Just an hour. That word choice, that diction. One hour can change your life. That's just a detail, but it's an important detail. Structure. The arrangement of large elements. The texture of this counter is very smooth. It's formica. But the structure, metal sides, probably some kind of particle board underneath, and big pieces. So don't leave college without becoming an expert in some kind of structure. And it doesn't matter what. Become an expert in planetary structures, in meteorological structures, mythical structures, biological structures, anterior cruciate ligament, all right? Uh, social structures, linguistic structures. As long as you know how something is put together, then that's what you have to sell. That's what experts know. They know about structure. Ah, uh, where are we at here? Form content we did. Setting is location, backdrop, where it happens. Sarcasm, also from the Greek. Sarcasmos. You know what this means in Greek? To tear the flesh from the bones like a dog. And that's why I don't use it. I wouldn't write on one of your papers, excellent work, parenthesis, for a dumbass. Damn, man. Nice haircut. You can do it yourself. <laughs> All right. Sarcasm. To tear the flesh from the bones like a dog. And you probably have a sarcastic friend or two, right? And maybe they enjoy twisting that knife just a little too much. Right, yeah. Is that, that's what sarcasm. Before you use it, remember its true meaning. To tear the flesh from the bones like a dog. Now, next one we have talked about. It's a biggie. Point of view. Always abbreviated, capital P-O-V. Um, let's just use a question with this one. Through whose eyes, the eye of Horus here, uh, through whose eyes do we see? Question mark. Through whose 
eyes do we see? Question mark. And furthermore, what is their truth? Through whose eyes do we see? And what is their truth? Through whose eyes do we see and what is their truth? Because I'll give you an example. I mean, the parking lot where you all park your cars, right? We like to think that exists, at least the parking lot exists in objective reality, right? Can we all agree that that is the same parking lot? We can at least agree on that. Forget political positions or anything controversial. We're never gonna agree on that. But let's at least agree that the parking lot exists in reality. We get that far, right? That it exists in some kind of objective reality. And yet even that, let's do a little thought experiment. You're leaving class today, and some hot stranger, whatever that means to you, <laughs> all right, runs up to you and gives you a kiss and runs off at top speed. Mm -hmm. Color your experience, right? <laughs> but, but for you, it's a hot stranger. For you, you like it. We're going to color this positive experience. The mysterious hot stranger gives you the kiss and runs off at top speed. They're also a great runner, apparently. All right? That's experience one, and you walk out the parking lot. Experience two, you're leaving class today, and the stranger walks up and boom, tags you right in the mouth. What the hell, man? Take a little blood, and then they ran off. You walk out to the parking lot. After experience one, this is a great parking lot. It's a nice and roomy, plenty of the park. It's nice and cool today. I love this parking lot. Experience two, you have a bloody lip. This parking lot sucks, man. It's hot and stoned. <laughs> wait, wait. We just agreed it's the same parking lot. And yet, depending on what just happened, it's a different parking lot, isn't it? So it turns out truth is what? Entirely subjective. It depends who's looking at it. Right? You know, the, the terrible tragedy that's going on in Israel right now. You know, if you ask somebody in the kibbutz in Israel uh, what's happening, they will tell you their truth and they will pass a polygraph that that is the truth. And if you ask somebody in Gaza what is happening, they will tell you their truth and they'll pass a polygraph that that's the truth. It depends whose eyes we're looking through. And it's very important to appreciate that because this expression, blank of the doubt, what's the word? Shadow. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting one. <laughs> Shadow of the doubt. Uh, but what's another one? You give somebody this. What do you give somebody? The blank of the doubt. Benefit. 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 It's like, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because I don't, I don't know everything about you. So I'm not going to judge, right? Because that word, when we look at diction, which is word choice, because if you don't give somebody the benefit of the doubt, then you are guilty of, diction is word choice, you are guilty of prejudice, and what does that word mean? Prejudicial to prejudge. You don't want to prejudge somebody, right, based on appearance, for example. And so golly, that's diction or word choice. Literal and metaphorical reading, we're just about done here because I think we did the first ones. Literal reading is dictionary denotation, simply what it says. If you got a misbehaving five-year-old and you say, listen, little dude, uh, you better turn over a new leaf. And he goes outside and he gets a leaf and he goes, oh, there you go, happy? <laughs> well, that's not what you meant. Right? Metaphorically, you meant, well, I want you to behave better. So, literal is what it says, metaphorical is what it means, and how do we get there? Through interpretation. That's, that's how we get there. Uh, last one, just a reminder of juxtaposition, putting two unlike things beside each other, so as to call attention to the qualities of each, and my example there, to always ask, what is the source of pleasure? Contrast, source of pleasure in a hot fudge sundae, it's not the cold vanilla, it's not the hot fudge, no, juxtaposition. It's cold vanilla next to hot fudge. 
right? It is thesis, juxtaposition, antithesis, which gives us, so that's A, B creates C, thesis, antithesis creates synthesis. A third thing, and that's the magic. That's the magic right there. And that's why falling in love is so much fun. It's not about you, it's not about your partner. The third thing you create, your love of him, all right? Okay, which you may or may not uh, want to keep on uh, um, perpetuating. All right, I think that's as far as we got. I think we did, anybody want any of those others up there defined and or examples given? I think we got through most of those uh, prior to this. Um, and you need any of those? Um, Yes. Catharsis. Catharsis is to be washed clean. That's another, it looks like hubris, which is pride. Um, catharsis is purgation. And we get it from a work of art. You see a film like Schindler's List, and you are purified. You come out, and all the petty bullshit is washed away from your life, and you're ready to recommit to your values and your loved ones and your dreams, and you're cleansed, cleansed of. Uh, pettiness and you are ready to recommit to significance. All right, 